Uh, welcome everyone to the Spectral Geometry in the Cloud seminar. Today we have the pleasure of having Daniel Stern, who will speak about new minimal surfaces via equivariant eigenvalue optimization. And the uh, virtual floor is yours, Daniel. All right. Well, thanks a lot for having me. It's great to be uh, back in the clouds with everyone. I think this is the third time I spoke at the seminar. Um, it's always fun. So I'm going to talk about some joint work with Misha Karpukin, uh, Peter McGrath, and Ralph Kuzner that dovetails with things that I've talked about in the past and I think you know many of you are experts in. On the other hand, I'm going to assume that not everyone is experts. So the first half of the talk will be boring for the experts and the second half, uh, hopefully will be a little more, more interesting. All right, so the fundamental goal of the things I wanna talk about today is really about minimal services. So just to remind you that a submanifold inside some ambient Riemannian manifold is said to be minimal if it's a critical point for the area functional of the right dimension. Right, and this is equivalent at the level of PDEs to saying that the mean curvature vector vanishes. These are, of course, classical objects of interest in geometry and analysis going back to the 1700s. Um, and we care about them in a lot of settings, but if you care about minimal submanifolds in any setting, then you're particularly going to be interested in two classical cases, which are minimal submanifolds in RN, because if you have any family of minimal submanifolds in uh, any ambient space, if you look at them under a microscope, you end up seeing entire objects in RN. And if you look under the microscope at the right scales, then you see not just entire minimal submanifolds in RN, but ones that also have cone structure. And if you take a slice of those with a sphere about the origin, you end up with closed minimal submanifolds in the sphere. So if you care about minimal submanifolds in any setting at all, which I hope you do, then uh, you'll certainly care about closed minimal submanifolds in the sphere. And this is the setting where we'll sort of start the talk today. And in particular, we're going to think about sort of the most classical version of this, which is the study of closed minimal surfaces in the free sphere. So uh, until about 60 years ago, there were just two examples known of closed minimal surfaces in S3. One is the most obvious, the totally geodesic ones, the equators. And then the slightly less obvious, but uh, still very symmetric one, the Clifford torus, just a product of circles inside of them. Um, and both of these low genus examples turn out to be very rigid. So the equator, going back to work of Almgren, is known to be the only minimal two-sphere in S3. And uh, by Brendel's resolution of Lawson conjecture about 10 years ago, we know that the Clifford torus is the only embedded minimal torus in the three-sphere. All right, you can ask what about higher genus examples? So already in uh, 1970, uh, Lawson had shown by a nice construction that there are minimal surfaces embedded of any possible genus, and in fact, at least two if that genus is not prime. And uh, using similar constructions back in the late 80s, Carker, Finkel, Sterling came up with new families of examples. Uh, in 2013, Choi and Soray came up with a few more in sort of a similar vein. And uh, uh, Capuleus and various collaborators, including Peter McGrath and Dave Weigel, have produced lots of families with sort of very large topology uh, and prescribed asymptotic behavior via these sort of implicit function theorem techniques, so doubling and desingularization, where you, you know, start out with the ansatz that you have a family of minimal surfaces converging to some prescribed limiting singular object and uh, try to uh, construct something explicit by, by gluing that. All right, so in spite of these many constructions, we still don't know all that much. So let's think about a few of the sort of, uh, key open problems about minimal, minimal surfaces in S3. So one sort of broad one, is what can we say about the number of embedded minimal surfaces in S3 of a given genus, right? So we know that the genus zero one, there's just one. Uh, the genus one, there's only one, again, like Randall's resolution of Lawson. It's still an open problem whether this number is finite. Okay, that's, uh, I think this has been claimed a few times in the literature, but it's still open to my knowledge. In the direction of lower bounds, until last year, it wasn't even, or I guess, uh, that's a year and a half ago now, so that's not quite right. But until a year and a half ago, it wasn't known whether this number uh, goes to infinity as the genus goes to infinity. And then uh, Dan Kedover confirmed this. So he was using min-max methods to construct genus two minimal surfaces in lens spaces, and then lifting them to S3 to get uh, high genus examples uh, that are converging to a Clifford torus with, with multiplicity two and the large topology limit. And uh, his argument gives something like an almost linear lower bound and then with some log blocks. But the point is that uh, you do in fact have a lot of examples converging to the, the Clifford torus. All right, so let's think about another important open question in the, the study of minimal surfaces in S3, which is what can we say about the least complex minimal surfaces in S3? 
So we, if we ask about complexity in terms of the area, and we can ask what's the least area, uh, let's say script A of gamma of a genus gamma minimal surface in the three sphere. So we know from just the monotonicity formula or various uh, you know, classical inequalities that A of zero is four pi. I guess we know this because of the uniqueness of the genus zero example, right? So the equator gives us the, the only answer in the genus zero. Likewise, we know that A of one by uniqueness of the Clifford torus among genus one guys has to uh, coincide with the Clifford torus, two pi squared. And in fact, by Marquez and Nevis's resolution of the Wilmore conjecture, we know that any other minimal surface of positive genus has to have area bounded below by that of the Clipper torus. So we have this lower bound uh, for any genus by the Clipper torus. It's a conjecture of uh, Rob Kuzner that uh, for any genus, this area is realized by the least area loss in surface of that genus which by uh, computations of uh, Heller, Heller, and Trize as this sort of expansion. Um, and moreover, these aren't just the least area examples, but also they minimize Wilmore energy for that genus, so along all surfaces of that uh, topological type in, in S3 or equivalently R3. Okay. Um, but not much is known about this conjecture. So the best evidence we have is by Kuvert, Lee, and Schetzler, who show us that the limit of these, this uh, least, least area as genus goes to infinity, and in fact, this holds for the Wilmore analog too, is eight pi. Okay, so we know that uh, the, the leading order asymptotics give us the right thing, that right? gives us this, this eight pi. All right, naively, if you're trying to solve this by sort of studying the space of minimal surfaces directly, you could hope that the space of minimal surfaces with a given genus and area less than eight pi is not too large. But it turns out it is. So, you can already see some of this from Kapolea's doubling constructions, but I also want to present some new examples, and Peter will follow up on this in this talk next week, that in fact, uh, there are at least roughly genus over four non-isometric embedded minimal surfaces in the three sphere of genus gamma with area less than eight pi. So in fact, there are quite a lot, and I don't claim this is a sharp lower bound either. You have at least, at least this linear growth. Okay, uh, I'll make an, an aside that on the other hand, at least for large genus, these don't violate Kuzner's conjecture. So by the method of construction, we can actually get pretty sharp area estimates. And we can see that most of the new examples have area growth that's like eight pi minus something exponential in the genus, and a few exceptions with area eight pi minus something exponential to square root of the genus. Whereas Lawson, if you recall, is like eight pi minus a constant over the genus. So these, uh, at least in the large topology limit, don't violate this conjecture. So for by the construction, uh, these also satisfy the conclusions of another major open problem for minimal surfaces in the three sphere, which is a conjecture of Yao's. So for any minimal surface inside the three sphere, uh, it's easy to check directly, and this is equivalent to being a minimal surface, that the coordinate functions are eigenfunctions of the Laplacian for the induced metric with eigenvalue two. And it's a conjecture of Yao's, which has been verified in most cases where it can be verified, that uh, that uh, these are actually uh, first eigenfunctions, right? These are first non-zero eigenfunctions with Laplacian non constants. Uh, so if this is true, then this would also suggest that every embedded minimal surface in the three sphere can at least morally be recovered by variational methods for uh, the first eigenvalue of Laplacian. And that's sort of the, the motivating spirit of the results today is trying to understand whether we can really use variational methods for the first eigenvalue of Laplacian to construct lots of nice embedded minimal surfaces uh, in the three sphere. Okay, and uh, some related problems in, for free boundary guys in B3. But um, to get there, I think we first need to recall uh, the classical eigenvalue optimization problem. So uh, uh, if we're just trying to maximize the first eigenvalue. All right. So let's just do some table setting and set notation, right? I'm using the positive spectral Laplacian on say a closed surface. Okay, I gave it an N, so apparently it's higher dimensional, but this N should be two. So we have the Laplacian on a closed surface M. Uh, and of course, this we have a nice spectrum. I don't need to tell this to the spectral geometry seminar, right? But we're gonna be interested particularly in the first non-zero Laplace eigenvalue, which uh, of course we have the Rayleigh quotient characterization uh, as the sort of uh, best constant in the Poincaré inequality. So, on a closed surface, we can normalize the first eigenvalue of Laplacian by the area to get something that's scale invariant as we scale the metric up and down. And uh, it's a result of Hirsch, who was the first one to realize we have sort of uniform topological upper bounds of these uh, in the late 60s and early 70s. So in particular, Hirsch observed that for any metric on the two sphere, 
this first eigenvalue of Laplacian normalized by the area is always bounded above by eight pi, that of the round metric. And moreover, equality only holds for the round metric, the metric of constant curvature. And uh, I'll just quickly remind you of the proof because it's really simple. I mean, even simpler than like the faber kron proof. Um, so, uh, right, the point is that by uniformization, we know there's only one conformal class on the two sphere. So, in particular, we can find a conformal diffeomorphism from uh, whatever metric we started with to the standard two sphere inside of R3, such that the coordinate functions are, are all balanced and, in particular, give test functions for the Rayleigh quotient. And then just uh, testing that the Rayleigh quotient definition of the first eigenvalue. Right, we see that twice the area of the standard two sphere, the image, right, which is going to be two times four pi, which is eight pi, uh, coincides with the energy of that map. And then since these are balanced, they're bounded below by the first eigenvalue times the sum of the squares of those coordinate functions, which is one since it's taking values of the sphere, which is lambda one bar. And you just read off the equality case that you'll, the only thing can happen is that this, is, uh, this map is an isometry or a homothety, and you have to be a round metric. Okay. So in particular, you have this uniform upper bound uh, on the oriented surface of genus zero. And from then on, the, the study of these uh, maximization problems took off. So Hirsch showed that round metrics maximize this quantity on S2. Berger became interested in this in the mid seventies and among other things, conjectures that the maximizer of the torus is given by the maximizer among flat metrics, which is the sort of uh, quotient by the equilateral lattice in R2. Okay, Yang and Yao, and uh, with later improvements by Al-Sufi and Elias, show that there is at least some universal upper bound uh, on metrics of a surface of fixed genus. Uh, and in particular, this is linear in the genus like this. And uh, then in the early 80s, Li and Yao introduced this notion of conformal volume, which sort of improves on Yang and Yao's arguments and used this to show, among other things, that the lambda one bar maximizing metric on the RP2 is the standard round. And already in Li and Yao's work, there's hints of some connections between uh, the maximization problem and minimal surfaces and spheres. But the next big breakthrough comes with uh, Nadarashvili's work in the 90s. So in the mid 90s, Nadarashvili proves Perget's conjecture, showing that the equilateral metric maximizes lambda one bar on T2. And he does it via direct attack, where he shows that a maximizing metric exists, maybe modulo some details, and then characterizes maximizing metrics. So in particular, you have the following observation. So if G is a conformal maximizer for lambda one bar, then there exists some collection of first eigenfunctions such that the sum of their squares is a constant, okay? So in particular, uh, and moreover, if it's maximal, not just in a conformal class, but among all metrics, then this same map or uh, one of these maps, one of these collections of phi one through phi K also has the property that if you sum up, uh, the tensors d phi j tensor d phi j, you get a multiple of the metric point points. Okay, some kind of kind of conformality condition. So in particular, if we read this off more geometrically, it tells us that if we have a metric that maximizes lambda one bar conformally, then we can find a map from that surface to the sphere to some sphere by first the Laplace eigenfunctions, <coughs> and moreover, if it maximizes among all metrics. Then we can find such a map which is also an isometry or you know an isometry of the scale so homothetic and from there to solve Roger's conjecture you need to argue that a maximizing metric exists and then you just need to rely on this montiel ross classification of uh minimal immersions from the torus to spheres by first eigenfunctions okay which show that it has to be applied all right so let's note all right that uh a map with by first eigenvalues is necessarily harmonic, which means it's a critical point for the Dirichlet energy among all sphere valued maps. And then it's a fact going back to at least Ulan back in the 70s, that if a harmonic map from a surface to a sphere is also conformal, then its image is in fact a minimal surface in the sphere. So it's a critical point for the area function. So in particular, we see uh, by Nadarashvili's observations that any extremal metric for this first eigenvalue has to be induced by some minimal immersion into some sphere by first eigenfunctions. Okay. All right. But since the 90s, there are only two more topologies where the explicit maximizing metrics have been worked out. <coughs> so for the Klein bottle, 
we know from work of Jacobson, Nadarashvili, Polterovich, and Al Sufi, Giacomini, Jazar, that lambda one bar is realized, uh, the maximum rather, is realized by some non flat work product metric, which can be minimally embedded in S4. And uh, Nayatani showed us show that equality holds in this Yang Yao algebraic inequality in genus two. So lambda one bar is maximized by some metric with conical singularities coming from a branched cover of the two sphere. All right. So maximizing metrics are a little hard to nail down in general, but uh, we can at least ask when maximizing metrics exist. Okay. So a lot of the work here was done by uh, Petrides about 10 years ago. So in particular, if we just restrict ourselves to a conformal class, then Petrides was able to show that indeed any conformal class contains a lambda one bar maximizing metric and with its associated harmonic map to some sphere by first diagonal functions. Okay, and then there are subsequent proofs by uh, uh, Karpukin, Nadarashvili, Penskoy, and Polterovich, and uh, sort of proof via variational theory for harmonic maps by Misha and myself that I talked about here like four years ago now, um, and that'll come up a, a little bit later in the talk. All right, so you have at least existence in a conformal class, and the moduli space of conformal classes on the surface is at least finite dimensional. So in principle, this reduces the whole thing to a sort of finite dimensional problem where now you just want to pick out a maximizing sequence of conformal classes and see what happens to these. But uh, this is still non-trivial because you have the bad situation. You could have a maximizing sequence of conformal classes leaking out to the boundary of the moduli space, right? So some uh, simple closed curves is getting pinched off and you lose topology. All right, but Petrina successfully argued back in this first paper in 2014 that in that case, you at least have some sort of continuity of the uh, this lambda one quantity. So if your maximizing sequence degenerates to the boundary of the conformal class, then at least this would force the uh, associated maximum on the lower genus surface uh, to coincide with the maximum of the higher genus surface. <coughs> so as a result, if you have strict inequality between the maximum of the first diagonal value on the surface of genus gamma and the maximum on the surface of genus gamma minus one, then a globally maximizing metric exists on the closed surface of genus gamma induced by some branch minimal immersion sphere. Okay, so you reduce the existence theory down to this simple uh, a priori monotonicity question about whether you have a strict increase when you look at the maximum on the surface of larger genus. <coughs> and so uh, it's sort of easy to see just by the asymptotics, the fact that these things grow sort of roughly linearly, that the strict inequality holds for infinitely many genera, but it remains open in general. All right. So one of the analytic ingredients of the results that we're going to be talking about in the next couple of lectures is a new method for establishing these kinds of strict inequalities. So that's where I want to go next. So let's suppose that the strict inequality fails for some genes. It's easy to see the non-strict inequality. So what's the situation? Let's consider the first genus where it fails. So we have the strict inequality and the existence theory for maximizing metrics up to, say, genus gamma. And then from gamma to gamma plus one, we lose the strict inequality. <coughs> okay, so now let's look at this last case, genus gamma, where we have a maximizing metric. Let's call it G naught. So previous attempts to prove the strict inequality have been based on the following idea. So you want to attach a handle to the, the maximizing metric on the surface of genus gamma and choose in a very careful way the metric on this handle to force the area normalized first eigenvalue to grow. So you're choosing a very specific metric on the handle and doing some delicate analysis to try to show that you get a strict increase in the eigenvalue for this precise choice of metric. So the approach we're taking today uh, varies a little bit in that we want to sort of avoid the problem of trying to choose a very precise metric and really just think about perturbing the conformal class and getting our estimates at the level of conformally invariant information. So here's the new idea. We're still going to be based on attaching a handle, right? So we start out with our maximizing metric on the surface of genus gamma, and we fix two, and initially these are arbitrary points, P and Q on our surface, and pick some epsilon that's going to be, say, pretty small relative to the distance between these points. <coughs> so we'll cut out two disks around these points, and then we'll just attach a flat cylinder where... Uh, we'll say the circle of radius epsilon cross the interval of length L times epsilon, but really we only care about the conformal data 
So I could just say S1 cross zero F, right? Okay, so we cut out these circles, we attach the hand. Still, so very simple to start. And we're just thinking about attaching this flat hand, right? So using this uh, min-max characterization of uh, the conformal maxima for lambda one bar that uh, I talked about four years ago here, and I don't respect uh, everyone to remember, but you don't need to, um, it follows that whatever the maximum is on this uh, surface of genus gamma plus one with this uh, new uh, conformal structure coming from this flat handle attached, you can find some map on the surface of the handle attached to a sphere such that the average, say, on the lower genus surface, take away the disks, right? So we just look at the average that we get when we take away the handle is zero. Um, while, okay, this is sphere valued, so the, uh, it's, you know, the norm of, of squared is one everywhere. And then uh, if we're assuming that the strict inequality fails, then uh, we can force the energy to be bounded above by lambda one of the lower genus guys, in particular by lambda one bar of this, uh, of the maximizing metric downstairs. Excuse <laughs> me, Daniel, I have a question. Yeah. When you attach the conformal cylinder, do you somehow know where you land in the moduli space of higher genus? Is it, does it, my question make sense? I, it makes sense. Um, let's see. So, right, I guess somehow it may be the relevant question is what happens as like L gets very big or very small, right? So, um, yeah, I don't really have a good but it's not something you picture for that. to know to to do what you're doing. Sorry? You don't need to to know that to do so what... The point is you're getting some conformal class on the higher genus. Guy, okay. And it's going to give you a test for... <laughs> yeah. The point is no matter what conformal class you get, right, as long as your desired, you know, strict inequality fails, then any conformal class will have conformal max bounded above by the lower genus guy. Great, thank you. Okay. So in particular, since you have this conformal max bounded above by the lower genus guy, and you can find, uh, you can think about this map as almost being like the harmonic map coming from doing the conformal maximization in this conformal class. <laughs> but since we have that it's uh, balanced, it sort of has average zero on the lower genus surface of the disks removed, and in particular be a test function for the Neumann problem on the lower genus surface of those disks removed. So I claim, and this isn't too hard to check, that the first Neumann eigenvalue on the lower genus surface with these disks removed is like the first Laplace eigenvalue minus something of order epsilon squared. <clears throat> so as a consequence, if we look at the energy of our map on now just the, the cylinder part, just the handle to be attached, well, it's bounded above by the full energy of the map, uh, which is bounded above by this lambda one bar, minus the energy on the lower genus surface with the disks cut out. But we just said, Right, we know that this map, this lower on the lower genus surface of the disks cut out, this map has average zero and norm one everywhere. So by the same sort of Hirsch trick for estimating uh, the energies in terms of the eigenvalues, we see that this gap, the difference between lambda one bar and the energy on the, the surface of the disk cut out is of order epsilon squared. So the energy of the map on this cylinder is bounded above by some constant times epsilon squared. <laughs> So the idea is to now leverage this into some kind of geometric information. So what's the what's the trick? So essentially by the fundamental theorem of calculus, if we look at the average value of the map over say the circles of radius epsilon at the boundary of the cylinder, then this is gonna be bounded above like, well, the square root of the length of the cylinder times the, uh, times the, the square root of the energy of the map, right? So we have some constant times root L times epsilon. So then if we take now the map on the lower genus surface given by extending f harmonically into the disks, then we can check that the energy on the disks is going to be bounded above like the energy on the cylinder plus some error terms that are like e to the minus l as the length of the cylinder gets, uh, gets large. Okay. And using this, we see that uh, if we take then the projection of this, this f hat epsilon l onto the first eigenspace for the maximizing metric, we get something which is very close in W12 to the original map, right? So we get something where the W12 squared difference is like epsilon squared times this e to the minus. <clears throat> so if we put all this together, we look now at these maps by first eigenfunctions. 
we see that uh, you know the norm is converging to one as epsilon gets small and L is sort of bounded away from zero. And then because these are maps by first eigenfunctions, you know the difference, uh, you know the difference of the averages on these small circles around the points of you know, points P and Q is comparable to the actual values <coughs> of this map by first eigenfunctions at those points, right? Because they have a priori C1, C2 bounds, whatever you want. So we see that we have these maps by first eigenfunctions. They're almost taking values in the sphere, and their values at these points are like, well, some constant epsilon root log epsilon, which in particular is going to vanish as epsilon goes to zero. Okay. So we end up with the following little conclusion, which is taking epsilon going to zero and keeping L bounded away from zero. We see that if we don't have the desired gap of genus gamma, then for every pair of points on this lower genus surface where the maximizing metric exists, there exists some sphere valued map by first eigenfunctions, which yields the same values at those points. Okay. <coughs> so it doesn't distinguish between points P and Q. But the point is these points P and Q are arbitrary. So for every pair of points, we have an extra sphere valued eigenmap that identifies them, which seems like way too many sphere valued maps by first eigenfunctions. So we conjecture that in fact, there is no surface like this. So uh, we can never find some surface, say, you know, given by a minimal surface in the sphere, such that for any pair of points, there's a sphere valued map by first eigenfunctions, which identifies them. Okay, and so if that's true, then by the analysis above, the strict inequality would always go through. So we can mention that uh, um, if in fact, you have a surface like this, <coughs> then you can check that, well, by taking the, uh, you know, fixing one point P and taking Q converging to P along some tangent vector, you can arrange that there's some eigenmap such that D phi kills any vector in the tangent bundle. And from this, since we also know that the norm squared of the gradients of any map like this is pointwise equal to two, you can check that a counterexample to this conjecture would give a minimal surface in SN with negative curvature. And uh, the existence of a, of a uh, minimal surface like this is actually an open problem that I think Yao mentioned in his problem section back in the 80s. So if you can find a counterexample, that would be interesting for another reason. <clears throat> And arguing in a similar way, you can see that if you replace the uh, two-point problem with three points, uh, such that you have a map identifying any triple of points, then the weaker conjecture is true. Because then you can arrange that you have something where d phi kills two directions, uh, which would violate this d phi squared being equal to two everywhere. And so in particular, if you, instead of attaching a handle, you attach sort of a tripod, a triple of points, and you can see that in fact, the strict inequality holds when you jump up to the genus by two. Okay. But so far, this, this conjecture is still open, so you aren't able to push it to the, the full existence theorem. Okay. On the other hand, when you impose symmetries, and you're, if you're able to force the eigenspace to be low dimensional, then you can check that, uh, uh, that a version of this conjecture is true in some simple settings that allow us to, in fact, construct nice minimal surfaces in, in low dimensional spheres. All right. So let me uh, go to the symmetric setting for a minute. So now let's let uh, M once again be a closed oriented surface and let's fix some finite subgroup with a diffeomorphism. Okay, so for now we'll just let it be arbitrary. Then instead of focusing on arbitrary metrics, we can think about just the metrics which are invariant under the obvious action of this symmetry group. So such that the pullback by any element, you know, gives us the metric. Value. And then we can uh, consider the max now of lambda one bar, not over the full space of metrics, but over just those that are invariant under this group action. Okay, so we're just looking at extremal metrics under this constraint. So I claim that it's not hard to check that uh, a metric realizing this maximum is going to be induced by an equivariant branch minimal immersion into a sphere by first eigenfunctions, right? So even though we're, you know, we're uh, solving a constrained maximization problem now with these symmetries by sort of the principle of symmetric criticality, Right, since our object itself is, is itself symmetric, then we're still sort of satisfying the same criticality condition that we would be if we were maximizing on all metrics. Okay, the, the usual, I mean, you know, it's a more complicated variant of the usual idea that if you are, uh, you know, if you're maximizing, a, looking at critical points of some functional uh, 
on a, a symmetric subspace, then the gradient will satisfy the same symmetries. And so checking criticality doesn't change when you impose symmetries. <clears throat> okay. So in particular, we can study this maximization problem. And in principle, uh, when maximizing metric ex exists, we know they'll give rise to some kind of still sphere valued uh, uh, minimal immersions by first stacking functions. Okay. So if we look at specific symmetry groups, these are of course arbitrary, so who knows what we can say in general. But if we uh, look at some things that are a bit more specific, we can say more. So in particular, if we think about a, a group which contains some reflection that exchanges two genus zero components of our surface, right? So we have a reflection that has a fixed point set that cuts our surface into two pieces. And we ask that both those pieces have genus zero. So we kind of have, you know, spheres connected by a collection of necks and the fixed point set cuts those necks in half and reflection exchanges those two genus zero pieces. So by essentially a variant of the first argument for um, the first Neumann eigenvalues on a fundamental domain, you can see that the normalized first eigenvalue there has to be strictly less than eight pi. <clears throat> and then by a variant of Chung's argument telling us that uh, the multiplicity of the first eigenvalue on S2 is bounded above by a three, you can see that the multiplicity of first Neumann eigenfunctions on this genus zero fundamental domain is still bounded above by three. And somehow the largest multiplicity you can get for the first eigenspace in the symmetric surface is when the first Neumann eigenspace and uh, first Dirich the eigenspace that fundamental domain coincide. So you'll get three plus one is four. So you get, uh, so for any metric uh, under these symmetry constraints, you have this normalized first eigenvalue is bounded above by eight pi, and the dimension of that first eigenspace is bounded above by four. So in particular, if you have a metric realizing this maximum uh, under these symmetries, then it's given by a minimal embedding into the three sphere. So right, the multiplicity four tells you that you land at some branch minimal immersion into the three sphere, but then uh, it's a standard uh, fact going back to work of Li Yao, or even just sort of the monotonicity formula for minimal surfaces, that if your area is bounded above by twice that of an equator, you have to be automatically in So if maximizing metric exists, then they're gonna give us some solutions to this problem that we, you know, we started out with, which is, can we you know, use variational methods for lambda one bar to produce minimal embeddings into the three sphere? <clears throat> so, uh, when I think that I'm missing a factor of two there. So there should be a 16 pi for this and then like an eight pi for the area, whatever. Okay, so if existence works out, then we get some interesting objects, but what about existence? Okay, so as with the sort of classical eigenvalue optimization problem, where we're just looking at the identity group, uh, it's not hard. I mean, you know, it's a little work, but it's not uh, too deep beyond the same kind of things that Petridis already did to see that we have a maximizing metric in any given conformal class, okay? So if we restrict to you know, a conformal class and restrict to those metrics that are gamma invariant, then uh, we have a maximizing metric you know, modulo, maybe some mild conditions that are easy to check in general. And then to prove existence of global maximizers, once again, you can reduce it to proving strict inequality among certain degenerations at the, of the, um, at the boundary of the moduli space of now these group invariant um, conformal classes, where now instead of pinching off sort of arbitrary simple closed curves, you're pinching them off in an, an equivariant way with respect to the group action. Okay. So in particular, you rule uh, reduce it to the sort of strict inequality. And the point is that for groups containing a reflection is above, this sort of handle attaching argument that we outlined in the trivial group case, uh, plus a few extra tricks, does the job in general. So for simplicity, I'm going to focus on the case where the group is just a single reflection. Okay, so we just have a genus zero surface. We have a reflection exchanging, excuse me, we have a genus, say, gamma surface. We have a reflection exchanging it into two pieces with uh, genus zero and gamma plus one boundary components. <clears throat> and in this case, the problem of uh, maximizing under metrics and variance under this reflection is equivalent to the following problem. So if we look at a metric on a compact oriented surface with genus zero and K boundary components, so we think about this as being a fundamental domain of uh, this uh, closed surface, then we can consider the minimum of the first Neumann eigenvalue on the surface of boundary and the first Dirichlet eigenvalue and normalize that by the area. And then we can look at the, uh, the maximum of this and it turns out this coincides up to a factor of two with maximizing the first Laplace eigenvalue 
on sort of the double of this surface, right? The closed surface you get by doubling this over its boundary. So if a metric realizing this exists, then uh, by sort of the results I just showed you, it's realized by a free boundary minimal surface in the hemisphere with K boundary components, such that if we sort of reflect that over the equator, we get a closed minimal surface in the three sphere with genus K minus one and area corresponding to this, this maximum A of K, which as an aside, you can show lies in the sort of eight pi minus something exponential in K range. Okay. And in this case, the condition for ruling out degeneration to the boundary of the moduli space is easy. It just corresponds to showing that uh, this A of K is strictly bigger than A of K minus one. Okay. And if you can show that, then you have a maximizing metric. <clears throat> So if the inequality fails, then you can run a handle attaching argument on this closed surface as you did before, where now the only catch is that you have to make sure that the handle you attach still respects the Z2 symmetry, right? Um, but then if you can run this still, and in particular, uh, it'll show that the minimal surface of genus K minus two, realizing the K minus one guy, has to lie in the intersection of S3 with some other quadratic cone because you set some other map by first eigenvalues uh, identifying these points. And it gives you some other quadratic relation on the first eigenspace, in particular on the space of coordinate functions of the minimal surface. But then it's not too hard to convince yourself that the only possible minimal surface uh, lying in a quadratic cone like this is the Clifford torx. <coughs> so then proving the strict inequality in general just boils down to showing that at say the genus two case, you beat the Clifford torus. You beat two pi squared. And fortunately, in this case, we already know that the loss in surface of genus two is embedded by first eigenfunctions, choice array check that satisfies Yao's conjecture. And by Marquez and Nevis's resolution of the Wilbur conjecture, we know that it has area strictly greater than that of the Clifford torus. So just using the loss, loss in surface of genus two for the case, I guess, k equals three, uh, we're done in every case. All right, it's kind of annoying that we had to appeal to uh, the resolution of the Wilmore conjecture just to check this inequality. I guess uh, if we didn't have that, we had to, would have had to work harder to, uh, to uh, see that inequality directly. Okay. And then the point is that essentially the same argument works for every pair containing a reflection of this type. So as long as we have a group and may say, say generated by reflections, and it contains some reflection that cuts our surface into genus zero pieces, then the maximization problem works out. And if we just apply this with Z2 cross Z2 actions, so by a pair of reflections, where one of the reflections acts like this, and one of the reflections, we vary the topology of the fundamental domain, we get this sort of result I advertised at the beginning of the talk, that uh, for any genus gamma, there's at least one plus you know, something like genus over four, non-isometric embedded minimal surfaces of genus gamma with area less than eight pi. Okay. So, of course, you can say more about the geometry of these things, but I think I'll leave that to, uh, to Peter and his talk next week. Okay, so now let's uh, say a little bit about the uh, free boundary case in the last 10 minutes. So if we have a surface of boundary, then, well, there's somehow, there are lots of spectra we could look at, but for these optimization problems, it turns out one of the most interesting ones we can look at is the Stecklau spectrum. So we look at the eigenvalues, of the Dirichlet and Neumann map, where we look at functions on the boundary, take their harmonic extensions to the interior, and take our Neumann data. And then the natural uh, scale invariant normalization of this, it's a first order pseudo differential operator. And if we scale by the length, we get something scale large. Okay. So if we focus uh, once again on the first non trivial eigenvalue, then the first isoparametric inequality for these guys is found by Weinstock in the 50s. We show that disks maximize the sigma one bar on simply connected planar domains. Then in uh, about 15 years ago, Fraser and Shane noticed that there's a very interesting parallel between the study of lambda one bar maximizers uh, on closed surfaces and sigma one bar maximizers on surfaces of the boundary. So in particular, they observed that if you have a maximizing metric for sigma one bar on your surface of the boundary, then it has to be induced by a free boundary minimal immersion <coughs> by first Steklov eigenfunctions into some unit ball, okay? Where if we boundary minimal immersion, this is a minimal surface, which meets the boundary orthogonally, which corresponds to being a critical point for the area functional among relative cycles in the ball. So it's somehow the natural analog of the variational sense of 
closed minimal surfaces in the sphere. All right, so the current status, the existence theory for these sigma one bar maximizers is pretty similar to the state for lambda one bar maximizers. So we know that maximizers exist in a conformal class. And um, we know, again, by work of Petridis, that uh, if, uh, max, if uh, there's an obstruction to maximizing among all metrics, it comes from things degenerating to the boundary of the modulized space of conformal classes. And that's once again reduces to a strict inequality. So in particular, if we define capital sigma one of gamma K to be the soup of sigma one bar over say the oriented surface <coughs> of genus gamma with K boundary components, we can say the following. So um, if sigma one gamma K is strictly bigger than on the one hand, the surface you get by uh, deleting one of the boundary components, and on the other hand is bigger than the surface with genus one lower, but one more boundary component, then if you have both those strict inequalities, where again, the non-strict inequalities are not hard to prove, then you have a sigma one bar maximizing metric on the surface of genus gamma and K boundary components. So by a sort of Steklov analog of the min-max characterization of the conformal guys, and a pretty straightforward variant of this handle attaching trick from the closed case, we can show the following. <coughs> So on the one hand, the inequality in the boundary components always holds. So this comes from the fact that when you run the sort of variant of this handle attaching argument, when you close up a boundary component, you end up with a map by first eigenfunctions uh, on the, say, uh, the surface with fewer boundary components, such that the norm at that point that you sort of attack, you know, where you've shrunk a boundary component to zero uh, is one, but then this would violate the maximum principle, okay? So you always have the strict inequality of the number of boundary components. And moreover, if the other inequality fails, which is sort of the analog somehow of the genus case, then for any pair of points in distinct components of the boundary, you can find some Steklov map by first eigenfunctions, such that again, it takes the boundary to the boundary of the ball, um, which identifies those two points. Okay, so uh, it's kind of a natural analog of the, the handle attaching argument in the closed case. So once again, we conjecture that the conclusion in the latter case can never hold. Uh, so strict inequality would hold and the existence theory would go through. But again, we haven't proved this conjecture yet. So in the low genus case, this is actually enough to complete the existence theory. So in particular, if you have a compact oriented surface with genus zero or one and any number of boundary components, you can conclude that a sigma one bar maximizing metric always exists. So in the genus zero case, this is just immediate because in this case, there's just one family of inequalities to check. And it's the strict inequality with, that comes from deleting boundaries. <clears throat> so that uh, that goes through immediately. In the genus one case, okay, so you have the, you know, this inequality goes through immediately again. And then the inequality that you have to check is that sigma one of one K, so genus one and K boundary components is strictly better than sigma one with genus zero and K plus one boundary components. <clears throat> so if that fails, the argument tells you that you must have a sigma one bar maximizing metric on the surface of genus zero and K plus one boundary components, which now lies in the three ball, which has the property that any pair of boundary points can be identified by a Steklov eigen. Okay. But it is not hard to see that if you have an extra quadratic relation on your boundary like this, then uh, the number of boundary components has to be exactly two. And since you have genus zero, then you know you have to be an annulus. And since you're a free boundary minimal surface, in B3 and you're an annulus uh, and you're uh, by first Steklov eigenfunctions, then you know that the only option is that you're the critical catenoid. And the critical catenoid, you can just check that by taking antipodal points, uh, you can't find any Steklov eigenmap identifying those two. Okay. So you have an easy contradiction in that case. So that's the where things stand in just the classical maximization for sigma one bar without any symmetries. But you can also look at symmetries in this case too. So you can pick some, uh, you know, look at gamma invariant metrics for some discrete subgroup of the diffeomorphism group of your surface of the boundary. And if you restrict to the case where now this gamma has a reflection, which you have to be a little more picky than you are in the closed case. In the closed case, you just need to cut in the genus zero pieces. In the case of boundary, you want to cut it not just in the genus zero pieces but into simply connected pieces. You're cutting somehow all the necks and all the boundary components. Then you can see that when a maximizing metric exists, it has to again be given 
by an embedded p boundary minimal surface in the three ball with area less than two pi. And for lots of gamma of this type, not all of them uh, at the moment, you can carry out a maximization program along the lines of what we have in the closed case to completion. So for instance, if we just take gamma to be a single reflection, cutting our surface into simply connected pieces, we get the following, that uh, there exists free boundary minimal surfaces in B3 of any topological type, oriented topological type, and area less than two pi. And in particular, these are embedded. So maybe a few comments on why this is a little more involved than the, the closed S3 case. The first is that it's not actually clear a priori whether the critical catenoid is the only free boundary minimal surface in the three ball whose boundary lies in some additional quadratic cone. So this comes up when you're doing the, this strip attaching argument. Uh, so, right, so for the closed case, we said the Clifford torus is the only one that's still also laid inside this quadratic cone. In this case, it's easy to see that any free boundary minimal surface like this must have two boundary components. And if we knew it had a uh, genus zero, then we would be done by sort of classification results. But uh, it's possible a priori that this could have higher genus. So it could be some higher genus example uh, who, with two boundary components that lie inside some extra quadratic cones. So it'd be interesting if, if you rule that out. And then even when you do somehow reduce everything to comparing with the critical catenoid, unfortunately, we don't have a nice analog of the Wilmore conjecture in, uh, for free boundary minimal surfaces in B3. So you have to work a little harder even just to do that direct comparison with the uh, sigma one bar of the critical capital than you do with the Clifford torus in the uh, in the closed case. All right, but um, I think I'll just leave off there for now and let people tune into Peter's talk next week for uh, more discussion. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Daniel, for the really nice talk. Uh, we have time for questions now. So uh, if you do have questions, please uh, write them in the chat or unmute yourself and, and go ahead and ask. Oh, Misha has a question. <laughs> Is that true? Oh, no, I see that's clapping. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I guess maybe I have a question, but maybe it's it's going to be in the next week's talk. Do, do you know what these surfaces look like somehow? Yeah, so we're, um, well, I mean, yes and no. So we're sort of writing a follow-up paper now. So for instance, in the closed case, we showed that all of the ones that we don't think are the Lawson surfaces are in fact, doublings of the stem equator in the so they have you know very rapid you know they have area going to eight pi very rapidly and as variables they converge to the equator say you know corresponding to the reflection so they look like the fraser uh surfaces that they they had proposed for this and, and similarly for the free boundary guys in b3 that's right most of them are going to be converging to doublings in the disk okay that's right yeah. interesting yeah thank you anyone else wants to ask something no if not well, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thanks for having me. And uh, have a great week, everyone. We'll see each other next week.